it is a big scary topic quite often and what i say to everybody when they start discovering it and going through it the most important thing i believe is to know about it in advance so that you can start preparing it it's a bit of a process there's a few steps to work through what you don't want to do is try and tackle color management in a time of crisis when suddenly you have to produce something with accurate color results and now you're trying to figure out how color management works that is when you don't want to be handling it so you want to sort of preemptively start dealing with it slowly incrementally getting it into your workflow so that uh, in a time of emergency you're not trying to deal with it in one big bite so it is a little bit complex there's a few links in the chain but I'll take you through it. This is just a introduction to it. I'm not going to go into too much detail. There are some other things that I could mention, but I'm going to keep it a bit short today. Uh, if this is something you want to take further, you can of course join the advanced course, which is starting in October. And also part of this content, which is there's three stages of this process, which also ends in the printing. And that also is uh, some of the subject matter we cover during the creative class and the creative series is uh, all about developing your style and just really changing your thinking about photography which is quite fascinating because there's no other course like it there's no one that offers something as unique as that product as dpc so well worth looking into and we've got one of those coming up on the 6th of august is that when the next one starts and there's a few modules in there you can take it as a package or you can cherry pick some of the ones you like and one of the modules is printing and output and that will also cover a little bit of what you need to know about the printing so I'm going to keep it relatively simplistic. There's some parts I'll delve into because I know people have a lot of questions in those particular areas. And just to give you, first of all, an idea of why color management is a thing, our cameras are a little bit fallible, no matter what you paid for it. I am busy talking to you right now on a 40,000 Rand video camera. The wall behind me is pink, but you are probably seeing it as like a violety purple. If I move away, this hotspot here, that's what the whole wall looks like to me with my naked eye. But this color here is what the camera is reproducing. The camera can't handle that shade. It's a particular hue that they usually struggle with, especially these video cameras. And so if you took a photograph of the pink wall, you would end up with a purple photo and you'd have no idea why or how to fix it or what's going on. And that is one example of color. And it can happen in a few different places. Let's jump into the slideshow and have a look at what we're talking about here. This is the a little bit of a summary of some of the content we work with in the advanced course. I'm going to jump you through it first of all by telling you just an over overview of what color management sort of involves. Let's see if my slideshow will start being responsive. So there's a few stages of it. First of all, you, when you take a picture, you get a scene in front of you, you click with your camera, but is your camera giving you a realistic view of that scene? Is it actually reproducing those colors accurately? Is the way the scene looks in real life how it captures onto the camera? Each camera is different. Each camera brand has its own color science. So how close is it to reality in the end result? And the next step is you put it on your computer, you start editing it. When you're editing your computer, on your computer, you're looking at it on a screen. The screen is backlit, it's got color profiles loaded in the, you're using color space. And it, it's a bit of a different process from your output. So when you're printing it, you're gonna put ink on paper. And how do all of these steps translate to each other? How, what's the chances of you getting a color in the first part and it follows through the chain and when it comes out on the printed paper, it matches exactly as it should. And how do you know what it should look like, our eyes are so fallible. The main problem with our eyes is they are so good at adjusting that we compensate and we're very forgiving for stuff. But in reality, it can be quite far off and we just basically compensate. Let's have a look at this picture here. So what, one of the big questions I get quite often is, is that, am I talking about white balance? White balance is a little bit different. Color management is getting accurate color and white balance is correcting for the color that you're picking up from the scene in your camera. So this picture, we've got a ladybug on a leaf with a quite a clean background. It's busy drinking some water. It's quite a warmly toned picture and all the scene 
all the elements sort of come together quite nicely. Eh? This is actually a warmly toned picture. The white balance is actually on the yellower side, but now the bug and the leaf and the background all kind of harmoniously match together. If I corrected the color to be as more accurate of what the scene actually looked like and the more accurate to what the bug looks like and what have you, we'd be looking at something like this. Now, as I jump, it's probably quite a big change for you. And it looks, it doesn't look as nice. The first picture looks better, but the longer this is on your screen and the more you adjust to it, the more, the better this looks. You can see that the white here in the front is quite nice and clean. This is orange as opposed to red compared to this leaf here. So there's a bit more difference here. And then the background is a third tone. So you've got this color brown, orange, and then red, and underneath this is a white area which has become more neutral, and so this actually becomes four shades. So as you look at this picture, it looks kind of quite clean and quite neat, and if I jump back now, that looks overly warm. It's kind of, it looks like it's too much. But these colors match better together because they look more harmonious, whereas these colors look split. So the longer you look at any picture, the less objectivity you have. The longer you look at it, the more you sort of accept it and it makes sense to you. So it's very hard to edit because you just start losing perspective on the stuff as you go. You could also cool the picture down and then you'd end up with something like this. That's a little bit too much and it probably doesn't look right, but you've got all these different versions of the picture and that is just talking about color temperature because you've got a warm picture, a neutral picture and a cool picture. But they're not telling us if the color the camera recorded was actually accurate. I just want to talk about one more part about color temperatures, just so that you can understand the difference between it and color management. This is the color checker passport. It's got all these colors on which you will get to, and then it opens up. It's got sort of a threefold system, and inside is this white balance card. And the way you would do white balance is if you take a picture like this, you can use your eyedropper in either Lightroom or in Photoshop to choose a point on the card to try and identify, to try and tell it that's what white is and it should correct the colors accordingly. Now white balance, most people think of as uh, you use your color pickers in, if we're using um, Lightroom, it's this little tool here. If you click on this and you click somewhere on your picture, you tell it that's the area to reference. And if you're in Photoshop, you can use your levels and then it would be this middle one and that would be your gray point set and you get your color. And most people think that because it's a white balance picker, you would click on white, but actually you don't usually get that good results from white. What you're trying to do is trying to find a neutrally colored part of the picture. And what that means is neutrally colored means it's gray, anywhere between white and black, but these values all have equal parts of red in them and green in them and blue in them. So this is a gray that is equally red, equally green and equally blue. All these values are the same, so they give a completely neutral gray. So your color, this white balance card, either this or this, you get an 18% gray card as well, which you use for exposure. That 18% is actually in the card's reflectivity and that gives you the a correct exposure. It's not the amount of gray. It's not 18% gray. It's 18% 18 reflective and it has gray in it. The important part of the gray is that the gray is a neutral gray. It is equal in the red, green, and blue values so that it matches each of them the same. If you're slightly off, if we're leaning towards this side here, what you're going to end up with is the blue is the same as the green, but the red is a little bit warmer. And then you've got a point that's got a slightly warmer tone. And the idea is if you click on a picture, you want to click somewhere. These here should all be tones of gray. That's what should be sort of black. That's white. And then these are all neutrally. If you pick on your picture here, that's where you should choose your color temperature from because it will set your white point, which means your all the values are equal. So it's not necessarily looking for white, it's looking for equal values. If you do in fact click on white in this picture, this is the white balance that it comes out with. And I hope you can all see, it comes out quite green. I actually picked here in this white writing and this is what the picture came out as. So white isn't always a great option because white can be off white quite easily without you being able to tell. 
when you're looking at these values again, white is going to sit at 255, 255, 255. And most pictures, if you're pointing on the white part, you're actually referring to something that's potentially burnt out or slightly off, and then there could be a color in it you won't be able to tell. So don't go for white. Black can work, but again, if it's crushed black, there's no detail in it, so it's just uh, zero, 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 and it might actually not be giving you that much information. So you look in your picture for a part that has some gray in it, neutral gray, and then if you click on that, you should get accurate color. So that is going to sort out the entire tone of the picture. That is now separate from what we're talking about with this color profile that we're about to create with color management. This is to get the picture color right, but each of these colors could be picked up by the camera incorrectly, and you might need to tweak it because it does everything fine, but maybe the blues aren't exactly the blue they should be. That's essentially color management. So for example, everyone have a look at this picture here. Is this picture, you can even put it in the comments if you want to, is this picture accurately colored? Are those colors true to life? Is that what it looked like if you stood there? So that's the catch, isn't it? Nobody really knows because no one was standing there. You don't have a frame of, of reference. You've seen a sunset before. They look kind of like that. That looks like a sunset. So chances are it was like that. But it also doesn't matter. If it's slightly warm or slightly cool, it's low stakes. It doesn't really matter what it came out like. You're judging it by the end result. Now, how about this one? This is a photograph of a shirt. One side is correct and one side is incorrect. Can you spot which it is? So hopefully now you're all warmed up and in the zone and this gets a bit easier for you guys. And if you've done the advanced class, class before and you get this wrong, shame on you. <laughs> okay, so I see a few people guessing. Oh. Mm, we've got some mixed results. Okay. So this is a photograph of a t-shirt. It is in fact this t-shirt here. The right hand side with the blue. This is exactly the same t-shirt. I've made a selection here and I inverted the colors. So this is an exact opposite of this shirt. So here where this uh, black stitching is here, that became white. And where the white stitching is, it inverts and becomes black and the blue becomes this pink color. This looks like a completely believable fabric. The only reason you can tell it's the wrong one is because this is like a tortoise shell button, and this one is the wrong, obviously wrong. It looks green. And it's only because there's one point of reference in this photo that you can have an idea that this side might be the incorrect side. Without that button, you could happily believe that this is what the shirt looked like. So it can be really wrong and no one will know. Like the sunset, that could be very inaccurate. But as, if you had a person standing in front of it and their face was the wrong color, then you would have an idea that that picture was not correct. But if there's no reference point, then you can get away with a whole lot more. The trick is when there suddenly is a reference point and someone's paying you money and you have to produce something. For example, one of the big uh, examples is always a bank because the banks have branding and they have branding Bibles and you have to produce pictures that match exactly. For example, Standard Bank have a Pantone color blue. And if you have to shoot something and the blue doesn't come out exactly the right blue, the question is, how do you fix it? And one of the big problems is, of course, our eyes are so easily tricked. They're so fallible. So now we're going to do, it's poll time. I'm going to start up a poll here. And I'm sure most of you will have seen this, but there's always a couple of people who haven't. The question is, what color is this dress? Is this dress black and blue or gold and white as far as uh, it appears to you when you look at it? I love watching this poll go. So for those of you who haven't seen it, this was a picture that was posted on the internet. This couple took a picture, uh, a mother took a picture and then she sent it to this uh, her daughter and son-in-law. They were getting married and she was saying, this is the dress I'm thinking of getting for the wedding. And then they said, which dress are you talking about? And she said, the golden white one. And they were like, what, what dress is the golden white one? There's only a picture of a, a black and blue one. 
And then they found out that they were seeing the same dress differently. And if you haven't seen this before, it is a bit of a, a thing to mess with your mind. So this is so interesting. Okay, we've still got a few votes to come in here. We're about halfway, but I suppose I can share it now already. Not skewing a bit. It was very interesting. It was on exactly 50-50. It was exactly in the middle. Uh, for, we have about 70 people, uh, you know, on, 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 on the chat. So, guys, please, um, we want as many votes as possible. There are quite a few people that haven't voted yet. So, throw us your vote. Have voted. Let's go. So, this is a fascinating uh, example. And I, I think without the internet, we would never have known that such a thing could exist, that people could experience one thing so differently. Okay, I'm going to end it there so everyone can have a look at the result because if I end it, you can share it. You can see how close it came out there. This was sitting at exactly 50-50 for a while. But at this point, most people, but not by a lot, say that they are looking at a gold and white dress and a whole bunch of other people are looking at a black and a blue dress. Now, just let that sink in for a second. We're all looking at the same picture. I've got it up on our screen. Half the people who are looking at this picture see a gold and a white dress, and the other half of the picture who are, people are looking at the same picture are getting a black and a blue dress. It is a complete <laughs> mind explosion. So have a look. I'm going to show you what the dress looks like to the two different groups of people. Because if you see one version, you usually can't see the other. You know, You can't even imagine what the other group of people are seeing. So this is what one half of you are seeing, and this is what the other half of you are seeing. From one photograph, we're getting these two versions of the picture. Unfortunately for everyone who voted gold and white, this is what the actual dress looks like. This is the real version, and this is what we were seeing. And the way it works is the color temperature in the photo was off. It's just a little bit different. It's a little bit skewed. And our eye is adjusting for that. It's trying to compensate. And um, it, it has a choice to make. Which way does it correct for it? And it chooses the wrong way, potentially, for some, half of us, I guess. And I, unfortunately... Uh, I'm very proud of my eyes. I think I've done a few color hue sorting tests and I always perform very well. And uh, I see the golden white, even though the true color of the dress is blue and black. So that's a bit disappointing. And there are some people who see blue and black. And then if they look at the picture, sometimes it jumps for them to the other version. Most people who see gold and white for the first time, it never jumps back for them, which is very disappointing. So yeah, I've only ever seen it the one way. This is an idea of how the dress works. So this is, there's the two versions of the dress. This is against a yellow background. And that yellow background, our eye tries to correct to try and make it white. It's basically doing a color temperature adjustment. And as it tries to make this go white, it basically, it, because this is yellow, it cools the picture down. And so you get a blue black effect. If, you're, if you look at that original picture and your eye decides that the background is actually um, cool, well, I should actually be saying it the opposite way around because it's going to compensate the opposite way. But if it's cool, it's going to make it, it's going to try and warm the picture up in your perspective. And then you'll see this yellow and the white version. Now, to make it even worse, <laughs> this color here and this color here exactly match this color here and this color here. Just to show you how bad our eyes are at dealing with color. I'm gonna show you a GIF that shows the animation of it. Let's see if the, I haven't actually tested if the animation will play on this PowerPoint. No, it does not. But I did actually highlight it for you because they take this piece of fabric and they move it across and it changes and it looks like it's a lie. But here's an actual sample. So I've, I've done a circle around this area here where you can see the black and the blue and here the yellow and the white. And now I'm going to remove everything else from the picture and have a look at them now. And even in Photoshop with a color picker, they have exactly the same color values. 
that and that shade and that shade look exactly the same and that shade and that shade look exactly the same and when this picture is up here it is absolutely impossible to imagine that that and that are identical <laughs> so you can't trust your eyes you can't trust your brain nothing is real anymore up is down down is up so uh here's another one to upset you as you can see in this picture of strawberries, the color is off. There's a, obviously like a tint going over it. But despite that, have a look at the strawberries and, and see, can you see that they are still red strawberries underneath the sort of green tint? Well, I've got more bad news for you. If we take those strawberries and we color sample them, this is the colors that come up on the side here. And it looks like this has got red in it. But that's the color there. And as you can see there, there's no red in that color. If you, your eye is basically doing a white balance correction and it's pulling out this green tint and then you get the, you get the idea that those are there, the reds. But if you look at these colors individually, you will see none of them are even close to red. There is no red tone in, or tint in any of these things. So what it comes down to is our eyes can't be trusted. We compensate too easily. Uh, nothing is real. We have to rely on technology and equipment to do color temperature for us. We can't do it by ourselves. This is a picture I had to do for a client who was doing a hair competition. They were doing hair coloring. And so I needed to take photos where the hair looked accurate like it did in real life and if you haven't gone through a color management process it's almost impossible to do you know when the when the stuff has to be produced for the next day to sort of tackle all the hurdles involved this is another example from that same shoot this is what the head looked like in real life there were three bands there's this gray then there's a sort of yellow middle layer and then it transitions to brown there's one two three distinct colors Okay, I took a photo with a camera and this is what came out. On the camera, you see one and then this sort of light area transitioning to a dark area. Now, just imagine you are the person who's being paid to take a photograph of this hair for a photo competition. You say, no problem. You get a studio, you set it up, you put the person there and you take a photo of this model and this is what comes out on the camera. And have a look, this is now, so this is what it looked like. Then I did the correction with the color profile, which I'll show you how it works. And then this popped up, it just appeared. It basically fixing the camera's flaws made the color come out accurate. Uh, and look at the skin tone, it's hardly shifted and this is hardly shifted and this is hardly shifted. So the question is, if you had this and you knew you had to get to this, do you think you have any idea in Lightroom or Photoshop which sliders to move in order to get that result? It's impossible. You would essentially be delving in this area here. Under calibration, you've got to slide these sliders and try and get that color to be in the right place while not affecting things like your skin tone and what have you. So it can be a bit scary. But what you essentially need, essentially need to do is calibrate your camera. So your camera has a sensor which records the scene in front of it, but it doesn't always do a very good job of it. Like this light that I showed you behind me. It's actually pink. It looks purple. The camera is not always doing a great job. And the way you do it is you make a little file that it corrects for the camera. So this is the x right color checker. This is a card with colors printed on it. Each color here is a very specific value and the software knows what each value is. So you take a photograph of this card, you open it up in the software, and the software goes, he's got these little markers here, and it's recognizing the blocks in this area here. And it reads this color, and it knows what color is meant to be here, and then it reads what color actually got recorded. So this is supposed to be brown, this is supposed to be orange, this is supposed to be blue. How good a job did the camera do? Then it corrects that color because it knows this is what, whatever value it's meant to be. And then it creates a file that changes the hue, 
the saturation, the luminance, all sorts of things it can do to adjust to get that color to be the correct color. So then it makes a profile and then it will change it. This is what this one looks like in particular. So this is the before and this is the after. So this is what the camera photographed. And then when you add the profile, it corrects it to make it look like this red. And you can see some of these colors have quite a big shift. Some of them, it did fine. So this particular camera handled green very well and it didn't need much correcting. But have a look at this color here. So this is another nice example of you do something like standard bank and you're supposed to be shooting blue. Your camera actually captures this. This is what it was supposed to be reproducing. And this is not per brand or per model. It's per camera, each individual camera. If you're a wedding photographer and you have two identical models, one is your primary and one is your backup, you would need to profile both of those because the sensors could be responding differently. And as age happens to them and things, they could respond differently. And have a look at this. This pink is also different. So if you look at this tone and maybe some of these tones here, you could see your skin tone could be quite far off. Now, I showed you that picture earlier of that hair with the colors. This is what it looked like out the camera. This is what it looks like with the profile added. You can see the difference in these shades here. Whereas you can't differentiate it nearly as well here. And that wasn't so much through editing as it was through adding the camera profile. So this is how the profile works, right? You take a photograph of this color checker passport and you open it up in Lightroom. You install the software, which comes with it. Then when you have your picture inside Lightroom, you can go export to the color checker passport. It will ask you to give that profile a name. Then you give it, you call it the camera you're busy using and it creates a, a profile. The only catch is that the profile is loaded into Lightroom, but it isn't visible until you close Lightroom and you open it again. So you will have to just do that process. And then what happens is here at the top under develop. So in the develop module, there's your histogram and right underneath it is profile browser. And these are the normal profiles that your camera comes with or that Adobe loads. And this is, you know, on your camera, you've got like landscape mode or portrait mode. It's those sorts of things. So they kind of tweak some of the colors to make it look better for that sort of thing. So for example, if you're in landscape mode, it's going to try and make your greens as rich and pure as it can and maybe bump up the saturation of the sky. So it looks quite nice. Portrait is going to try and do nice skin tones, but maybe not, uh, be a little bit careful on the red because otherwise people look a bit drunk or pink, you know, in burst blood vessels or something. So these are the different profiles, but now there should be a new one under your custom profiles and it says Canon EOS R, the one we just made. And then you apply that to your picture. Now remember again, this is separate from white balance. White balance is an overall change in the picture and this is a change per color. And here is what this EOS R did after that profile was loaded. So the camera was photographing this purple like this. When you turn the profile on, it reproduces purple like this. So the purple needs a bump in its saturation. He has the blues. Some of them are close. Some of them are further. These aren't too bad, but look at these blues here. That's okay-ish, that's okay-ish. The, the trick is you cannot adjust these by eye and by hand to try and get the right colors. But the good news is once you've done this, once you've created a profile for your camera and you load it into Lightroom, you'll never have to do it again. It sits there and then each time you bring the photos in from that camera, you can just automatically apply that profile. Here's an example of a photo in real life where the profile is applied and where it isn't. Have a look at this camera. It didn't do the blues particularly well. This is a photograph and look at the difference in this blue hat. That's what it looks like straight out of camera. That looks like what is what it looks like in Lightroom with the profile added. Look how this stripes change on the shirt. Look how the hat changes here. You can see there's a slight mismatch in the alignment here is because it also added the lens correction profile on import as well. But there's no color tweaking or anything. It's simply having that profile added where it takes the colors the camera reproduces, fiddles with them slightly where they need to be corrected, and makes this picture more accurate. Now, it's an accurate start point. And for me, that's the most important thing is that you just start at a neutral, accurate base. And from there, you can make artistic decisions and edit. You can make it warmer, you can make it cooler, and you can fiddle with it. But you want to have a good beginning point so that you 
can fiddle artistically as opposed to try and do corrections by eye, which is incredibly difficult. And as we just saw, our eyes will let us down. And then what's good is once you've created those settings, you can make a preset for your import. So each time your pictures come in, it automatically applies these basic values, which has got your lens correction on, and then your process version and your calibration. And now recently, you can have even have ISO, but it's adaptive. So depending on what your ISO value was, it can dial in different amounts. And so it's one of those things, if you go and buy a color checker passport, it's a lot of money. You'll take a shot and then uh, once you've got the profile, you don't really need the color checker passport. It's done. It's done its job. So uh, then it just sits in your cupboard. So in the advanced course, when we go on the practical outing, I bring the color checker passport with me so everyone can take a photograph of it. Then when they go home, they can make their own profiles. The software is also loaded inside the the Google Classroom we use for the advanced course. So the, the software you can download freely, it's easy to get. The problem is the software doesn't do anything if you don't have that color card to shoot. So, ah, oh, there's Google <laughs> listening to me. So you need to, yeah, you just need to attend the advanced course, take a shot on the class and then make your profile and then you've got it sorted out till you buy your next camera body. Okay, are there any questions at this point before I go on to the next thing that needs calibrating? John, I'm quickly going to read the questions for you. We also have a question on yeah. Facebook Live. So the first question we got was from Steve Castings, where he asked, how would you differentiate between color grading and color management? So that's the first question. Okay, so generally color grading is a, it's a term used a lot in film where you actually take color and then you fiddle with it. It's a slightly different process because what you would do with film generally is you shoot a very flat picture. So you use um, different uh, sort of recording profiles like S-Log and it, what it's trying to do is record as much data as possible. It's basically shooting an HDR. And if you've ever shot an HDR, you know that the original version is usually quite bland. You then take that HDR file and you edit it to try and get some punch out of it. Because the more latitude you have, the more stops you have, the flatter the picture is. Because there are no, there's no contrast, essentially. There's no bright points and there's no dark points. Everything is sort of safe. So to try and give it life back, then you have to edit it. So color grading is usually the process of taking that flat version of the file and then tweaking it and using lookup tables and what have you to try and give it some punch and some life and maybe even a look. So uh, not necessarily an accurate color, but something artistic or something that suits the style, like the bad boys films have a very specific particular look or any of the Michael Bay movies. And that would be more what color grading is. It's not necessarily accurate color. It's taking a very blank surface and then manipulating to get uh, interesting colors and usually grading, unless you're trying to get to a very neutral base point, it's usually a more creative artistic thing and not so much a scientific accurate thing. You should ideally, even if you're using that process, you should shoot a color checker card to make sure that you start with accurate colors and then you can fiddle with them from there. So even in film, on some of the clapperboards and whatever, you get sort of color charts or color checkers or just color spot points that you can test your color against to make sure that you're getting what you need out of it. Great. So the second question, it, it's, it's rather a statement made by Rina van der Merwe, and, and I think she's accurate, but um, you can answer that. She says, is this actually our brains seeing? Yeah, our brains don't see. Uh, I mean, our eyes don't see, our brains see. Our eyes are just a way of picking up the light and the brain does all the interpreting, which is why some people are colorblind. Some people have synesthesia, which is where they see sounds or hear colors or weird things like that. It's basically those channels in the brain. Also, the brain, everything we see is flipped upside down and the brain turns it around. If you wear glasses that invert the world, after a while, it puts it back the right way around again. Then if you take the glasses off, everything's upside down for you. Then the brain has to rework it around back again. So most of it is being seen, it's done by our brain and our brain is a big old filter. It just tries to make everything as simplistic as possible so it can cope. And so uh, it often takes shortcuts and that's where the problem comes in. 
Great. So another question by, by Stephen from the UK. He says, do you calibrate a lens and body or just the body? We know the answer to that, but yeah, I'm going to leave that to you as well. Lens shouldn't be a problem. The main thing that you're calibrating on a lens is things like it's vignetting and it's uh, how much it distorts it. It shouldn't, if it's no modern lens should give any kind of color cast to a picture. It shouldn't matter. And then we also have a question from Romeo. Is the, the color checker plugin available in Photoshop as well or just Lightroom? No. So if you have the software, you can actually use the software to create the profile and then it will automatically distribute. If, if you install it and you tell it it's, you've got Lightroom, it will put the, the profiles in the correct place. But generally it's going to... Uh, you, you, ideally be used in Lightroom and then you can export your pictures into Photoshop and edit them there. It will take that color information with it, but Lightroom is your color is your image management system. So that's where the profile is best added in Photoshop specifically. There's no way to do that, but in Adobe camera raw, which is that program that opens up. If you open a DNG specifically, it's kind of like the Photoshop version of Lightroom. I don't know if you're all into, uh, familiar with that interface, but there you could select color profiles or add them. Right. And then David is asking, do you need to take a picture of the X-Rite for each shoot? I just want to mention that, you know, the previous question that Stephen had about the lens, sometimes it's just a good habit to create a profile for each camera and lens combination. If you, if, especially if you're using, you know, odd lenses, but yeah, John answered that question well, but yeah, so I've done it. Uh, on one or two occasions where I would create, where I had a third party lens, where I always felt there was a slight difference in color that I actually created a separate profile for that camera and lens combination together. I mean, but it's, it's not something that's going to cause you a lot of headache. And then, yeah, and then David's question, let me just repeat, do you need to take a picture of the x right for each shoot that one does? So x recommends that you do that sort of how they've set it up or the, how they intended to be used. If you set it up yourself, they, you can do a color profile like I just showed you, or you can do a slightly fancier one where you shoot your color checker passport under two color temperatures. So you shoot it in daylight and you shoot it in tungsten. And then to compensate for any kind of variation or errors that come, creep through because of white balance, it will make a profile that takes both factors and combines them. So you get a dual uh, profile in the menu. And that uh, is a very, makes a very accurate profile for your camera. And then I used that um, x right color checker on a few shoots under different lighting conditions because sometimes you're in the studio or sometimes you're outdoors. And so I just, you when you've got your camera, your whole scene set up, you snap a shot of that as a reference and then you... You can use it for, you know, especially in Lightroom, if you're batching pictures, you set, you edit your color checker passport photo, and then you just batch it across the rest. But I have to say, I never found that much difference between using the, that profile that I created and the each individual shoot profile. So I stopped doing it. I found that the one profile was good enough to cover every scenario. Sometimes there's a shift, but it can be tiny. It can be so small that it's not worth doing. The only time I use it for a shoot is if it is a shoot with particular color requirements. Like I did a, uh, I did 10,000 odd photos for a company doing their, um, they were building up the catalog of their products for a party and event company. So they had to have each shade of tablecloth and napkin and, uh, placemat and plates and all the crockery and what have you. They had hundreds of thousands of different items and they want to put on their website and you had to make sure that you, they showed them accurately so that the website would show what you're getting. You know, if you've got a pink and a coral and a rose and a whatever kind of shades of tablecloth, you have to be able to show each of those so that when someone looks on the website, they can see that there's a difference or that they don't match or try and choose the color they like and whatever. And so for that particular shoot, I was very meticulous about using the color checker passport because I wanted to ensure the color was specifically accurate. But for, I would say for most things, one profile is good enough. You don't need to do it on each shoot. Um, x right thinks you should, but I didn't see enough advantage. If I can just add, you know, if you're going to do particular 
commercial projects, food photography, or you're going to shoot furniture or clothing, then it might be a good idea for that particular yeah. session. But apart from that, you know, I, I just stick with my original profiles. And so far, it, it's been fairly accurate. You know, after you've created the profile, I do not find massive deviations. And as I said, sometimes with, with certain lenses, I do find this, a, this is a very, very slight deviation, but it's not that massive. So yeah, that, that's why I agree with John fully. It's not necessary to create a preset every single time you're going to go out on a shoot, maybe just for very important shoots or for commercial work. Now we're going to talk about calibrating your screen. And this is a part that people usually get a little bit upset about because they find out there's problems with their screen. Have a look at this shot over here. Um, this is my kid after I told him I'm going to take a picture of him. That's the face I got. So uh, you can see that it is quite a cool picture. It's um, not very warmly toned, but um, it kind of goes with the mood. This is what it would look like if you decided to, you liked that it was cool and you cooled it down a bit further because it matched the idea of the mood is that it's, you know, a little bit cold. But if you wanted to make the face a little bit warmer because you actually thought that the face is looking too cold and you don't want it to look like he's a white walker or something, then you could warm up that face a little bit like that through a little quick edit. The problem is now you've got, if you want to edit your, your picture and you've got a start point like that, and you either want to make it cooler or you want to make it warmer. If you've got a screen that's not correctly calibrated, if your screen is warm and you warm a picture up, then when you print it, you've got warm plus warm, and you end up with a person who looks like they've got self spray tan on or something. If you've got a cool screen and you decide, oh, I, I like the idea of this picture being cool, and you cool it down further, then you've actually started with a cold image that you've cooled down, and when you print it out, the person's going to come out blue. So how do you know how much you should be editing? Because you don't know if your screen is set up correctly to give you accurate colors. Without a profile running, your, your screen is, uh, it could be anything. It could be warm, it could be cool. And generally speaking, it's far too bright. And the contrast is set up with, with there's far too much um, information in the dark areas. They sell this as a great feature for your screen is that it's got a, a million to one contrast ratio which sounds great, but you can't print that. Printer won't be able to reproduce it. So all your pictures look great on your screen. They've got shadow detail, which is amazing, but when it comes out the printer, it looks like mud, nothing's there. It's all black information. This is what it looks like after you've calibrated your screen. I'll show you, this is a screen I had. Bef when the computer booted up, it would look like this. And then as the profile kicked in, it would jump to this. It was about that much difference. Now, some screens don't need that much correcting. Some screens do. It depends what you're working with. I find generally speaking, because I've calibrated a few screens now, that laptops tend to uh, be quite cold. They lean towards the cool side. Manufacturers prefer it because it looks very crisp and very clean. If you open up a document or something, it looks very nice uh, and crisp and good and vibrant and what have you, but it's not actually made for photo editing. So if you try edit on that and your screen is actually at the starting point, if you try to warm that picture up, you don't know what to, to what point to do that. Uh, if you try cool it down, it's you're sort of shooting at a moving target. So it's very important to get your screen calibrated so that you're dealing with these issues. The other thing is um, some screens need less calibrating than others, but it's exactly the same thing as the camera. You could saw that there could be slight shifts not just in the whole thing is warm or whole thing is cool. Some colors aren't being reproduced particularly well. So let's do another poll quickly. There's a picture coming up here. Between these three shots that are on the screen, which one is the correct color for that image? John, can I just mention, guys, do not answer on the group chat. Uh, remember, there's a separate polling uh, um, window so please answer on on the on, on the polling um, on the polling window we've got almost 70 people here so I want every person to vote this one
So this is going to show again a bit more of the problem that we have with this color management. Um, unlike the uh, unlike the camera, which I said the profile stands up quite well under a bunch of circumstances, the screen they recommend that you calibrate it every three months to make sure that the color is accurate. And if any of you are working on two screens, you'll know the frustration of if your two screens don't look alike, how difficult that can be to work with. So we've got a bunch of votes in, and the main thing I want to share with you here when, when this pops up here and you see the results, most people said number three is the correct one, and you may or may not be right. The point is not everyone agreed. The, even though one of these is correct, not everyone here is able to spot which one it is. There's a bit of a mix in the answers. So how, are we able to objectively decide which is the correct one when we can't all agree on this picture? You know, your eyes are again going to sort of let you down and it depends on what monitor you're looking on. Um, for the record, number three is actually the closest to accurate as I look at it here on a calibrated monitor. Um, but your monitor, let's do another quick test. If you looked at that picture and you weren't sure which was the right one, have a look at this. You can do this in Photoshop. There is, if you take, if you open Photoshop with a blank canvas, you can take uh, your color picker and make a black square. So this is black as in red is at zero, green is at zero and blue is at zero. Make a block of color on your canvas and then change these values slightly. In this next shot, I've gone up by 15. So this is um, 15 blue, 15 green, 15 red. So again, it's a neutral color, they're all matching and I put that block next to the other one. Can you see the difference between these two blocks? On your screen, can you see that this one and this one are not the same on this point here? Or do they look identical to you? That's gonna give you an idea how well your screen is set up. If it's very obvious to you, then you might also have a problem because your screen is set too bright. And when you print it, that color's not gonna come out. It will just look the same again. It's a slight difference, but there is a difference. The same is true of white. This is a 15 point change and that came out with quite a big difference. I hope you can all see on your screen quite a big difference here. But this is what happens when you, I, I fiddled with it. This is 15 point change. This is a five point change. So here it's come down only slightly. Instead of 255, it's 250, 250, 250. And here, that's the new color, that was the original color. So the original color was pure white and now it's come down by a touch. And if you can't see a difference between these two, your screen's not displaying color particularly well. Who's panicking now? Then there's another aspect, <laughs> sorry Len. <laughs> Um, color costs. There's another problem that we have, and it's, it's very similar and related. This is an image of a bird, and it looks like a little brown bird, and it's got a little green caterpillar, and there's a green background, but actually the color, there's a color cast over this entire picture. It's all toned with a bit of yellow. If I edit it out, and one of the easiest ways to edit something like this out is you just hit auto levels, control shift L in Photoshop, and now have a look at the difference. Look at the two sides there. That's what it looks like. That's what it's meant to look like. That's what it did look like. Now before, it didn't look that bad, but once you've seen the corrected version, you see how far off it was. If your screen is warm, you just get used to it. And you won't notice when you should be fixing it. And you could also overcorrect either way. So what you need to do is calibrate. You get a couple of devices. There's a few options available. Um, this is an image of the spider. There's also the color monkey, which is, I've used both um, at different times. They're very similar. There's not much difference. And it's doing a very similar job to the color checker. What the color checker did was it, it had colors that it knew the values of. Then it looked at what the camera reproduced and made a corrective file. This is doing very much the same thing. So you put this on your screen and then it jumps through a series of colors. 
at the moment it's got a gray one on and it does every shade and this device reads what color is being shown. So it knows that the file that it was outputting is supposed to be red and then it re records what color actually came out. Was it a good red or does it need some shifting? And then through that, it makes a corrective file to fix your color. And usually when you turn on your profile that it's created, your picture looks worse. It looks terrible. It's much darker and it's not what you used to. So before you throw out the calibration, just give it a while and get used to it. Work with it for at least 40 minutes before you decide to, um, to scrap it because it is going to be a big change from what you used to. But it will give you an accurate start point. From there, you can still tweak it and fiddle with your picture and do what you want to. But you have to, start, you have, to have a good solid start point. There are two different screens here. This is a normal Samsung monitor and this is an NEC monitor. This is about 3000 Rand and this is about 23,000 Rand. The problem with the profile is it lives on the computer. It's on the hard drive. It's the corrective file that lives with it. It doesn't travel with the screen. As soon as you unplug the screen or plug the screen in a different computer, that profile is missing. These particular models have the profile embedded in the screen with the monitor. This uh, little calibrator is also built into the screen. It comes with it. And so wherever you plug the screen in, you know the screen is accurate. That's basically how it works. You get a device that reads the color and corrects the color to try and make it more accurate. Um, there are a few things to take into account with uh, calibrating, but I'm not going into it there. We covered it in an advanced course. This is just a little introduction to get you to understand it, essentially. And because I know that before you started this class, everybody was quite happy with their camera and quite happy with their screen. And now suddenly everyone needs to throw a whole lot of money at a problem they didn't have an hour ago. I've added this picture just to make you feel a bit better because um, suddenly life feels hard. Um, are there any questions before I go on to the printing part? So Delita is commenting. She says, oh, cute. So that's the only comment we have. <laughs> uh, so guys, uh, yeah, please, um, uh, you know, throw us your bones, throw us questions. Um, just, uh, you know, as a side note, uh, for Quizita, Sean posted uh, the link to the x right Color Checker software uh, to do the Mac downloads um, in the chat group. And we will also make it available in Google Classroom for the X advanced students as well. Yeah, I see Renata's has got a, quiz, uh, a comment there about crying. I'm telling you, most people take this part of the course very badly. It's quite a shock to find out um, that there could be such problems. The difference is usually people are sitting in the class and then they're wondering about their work. You're now sitting at home. And if you can see that there's problems in the colors that I just showed you and on those swatches that there's not enough differentiation, then uh, you realize that you've got things to sort out. Now, for most pictures, it's okay. You know, it's not a big issue. It's when you're trying to do commercial work or particularly things like weddings or something like that. You've got brides, you know, there's 500 different shades of white wedding dress. There's ivory and snow and silk and pure white and off white and cotton white and all sorts of things. You have to be able to produce that result um, accurately and your camera won't do it without the proper calibration and set up. So, so there are some about there are some more questions about um, from Mandy. Do you calibrate our screens in the advanced course? I can answer that for you, but I'm going to leave that for you. And then, so, yeah, <laughs> no, unfortunately, all of these manufacturers have in their terms and conditions that you are buying a license to calibrate your screen, and you can calibrate more than one because most people have a two screen setup if you're a photographer and usually you've got two screens and you've got a laptop. So you need to calibrate a few devices, but in their terms and conditions, they actually reserve the right to remotely shut off your device. If you use it to calibrate every one of your friends screens, if they feel you're being abusive, then they can lock it off. And I have looked through all the manufacturers and I haven't found anyone who doesn't have the clause that they can remotely disable your device device. They'll kill it. I also just want to mention this, guys. Remember, uh, this is very important that you, that you calibrate your camera at least as a start. You know, I don't, and, and then you get your monitor as, 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 as close as possible. So I would suggest if you have one or two friends uh, sharing 
uh, one of those devices, it costs a lot less. And we've been doing that among a few of us that we've been sharing, um, you know, a, a, a calibration device between two or three of us and it costs you less. Obviously, um, you know, I didn't buy one. I, I always have friends with those devices, but um, but I, I would suggest that you, that um, it's not going to be an issue if you're only a few people. And also, if you're not going to do commercial work or very serious photography as, as a starting point, you know, don't get it. Just make sure that you calibrate your screen manually. There is um, other uh, basic calibration software out there that, where you can just test the the, um, uh, the pictures, which is a, a little bit more difficult than than uh, you know uh, using a spider or a, or a color monkey. But I would suggest that that you do look at just alternative methods as a starting point. But the moment you're going to do any commercial work. Uh, you're going to shoot uh, hair shoots or product photography, then you absolutely have to make sure that your, your screens are calibrated. Uh, another question um, is that, um, yeah, so the cost of calibrating a PC screen uh, from Reno, which um, John's probably going to tell you, um, is, is sharing a, a device with somebody else, but we didn't say this officially. So remember, that's yeah. an unofficial statement that we make. And, um, and then, um, so uh, Steve's asking, so to get a good picture, do you need to calibrate the screen and camera for print? Absolutely. And then your printer, which is the next stage. So David's saying, I've been through the pain, but it's worth it. Um, and then um, there's a, a Facebook question. Oh, Steve, uh, John's already answered the question, um, but maybe you want to answer that again. How would you differentiate between color grading and color management? Because he popped into the, the Zoom meeting because the Facebook live was lagging a bit. So maybe if, if you would just pay him the courtesy and, and answer it again. I know you've done, but uh, it will be pretty, pretty cool um, to hear. Well, the, a, a shorter version is that color grading is almost always a creative process and color management is ensuring you've got accurate color right through your workflow. So grading is to take your footage and then uh, tweak its colors. And you can use look, look up tables and tools like that. But uh, color management is to ensure that your camera is reproducing an accurate color and that your screen is reproducing an accurate color and that your print is reproducing an accurate color. Grading is usually tweaking color, but it's not necessarily to try and make it as true to real life as possible. The final question, um, I think you've answered it, uh, but maybe just just for the sake of, of recapping, uh, Rosalie is asking, would you need to calibrate your screen regularly? I think you mentioned every three months or so. The manufacturers generally recommend three months. There's a few steps in the calibration. The software handles most of it, but um, you should clean your screen first. The screen is static, so it attracts dust. So usually if you wipe your screen, it's quite scary how much dust comes off onto the cloth and you should run your screen for 30 minutes before you do your calibration so that your colors can settle and all that sort of stuff. And then they recommend every three months and to the extent that the software, which you can set up reminders so that it actually does tell you that you're due for another calibration again. Um, once you've calibrated your screen the first time, every three months, if you do it again, you won't see as big a difference. It might tweak it a touch, but, uh, it's less important than just getting a good start point. Right. And then, and then just something I, I want to note is uh, previously I had um, different lighting situations in the office. So I had daylight during the day and in the evenings I had fluorescent lights and I also realized it had a slight impact on my, on my colors as well. So uh, typically the best is to close your curtains if you're doing any any color accurate work and make sure that you work under the same conditions after you've calibrated. Um, but maybe you just want to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. So there are people, particularly we've been talking about grading a few times now, the professional grading services and companies in Hollywood and whatever you, they got rooms set up that are gray, that they don't have any color in them anyway, because that color off of the walls bouncing off your screen. If you're wearing a bright colored shirt, that thing is reflecting off the screen again. And that can, all of these little elements can influence your color perspective, uh, perception. So when people do this thoroughly at a professional level, then they can often, um, paint the rooms gray, have gray carpets, have gray roof, all sorts of things to try and take away anything that might shift the color off. But for us mere mortals, it's a bit of an overkill. Um, you agree, John? 
Yeah, and I mean, it's, it depends on what level you're at or what you're trying to achieve. I know there's even photographers who absolutely demand that the assistants wear black clothing because if you put an assistant with a red shirt next to a bride holding, because they're standing there holding a reflector, you can see that color pick up on the, the shininess of the dress and what have you. You can see in pictures where you have the person there and where you don't, the difference it makes. But it depends how pedantic you are. And no comments here, Donnie, about how pedantic I am as the person who owns a color eye checker. I'm, I'm, I promise I won't say anything. And then um, there's just a, another note by Steve. He says, make sure you turn off auto adjust on your monitor or laptop. That's pretty important. Thanks for, for uh, that statement, uh, Steve. Um, uh, and then um, Phyllis is asking, if your screen comes with calibration software, can you use the same software to calibrate the laptop screen? So there are screens that have like a setup process and they're usually dealing with gamma and things like that, but, or you're choosing a color, a white point, but they're not particularly comprehensive color management um, tools that are included. They just to sort of give you an overall look, but uh, they're not going to do things like um, drop your contrast down so that it gives you a more realistic preview of what a print will come out like. Right, so, so that, that's the end of the questions, guys. Uh, we're going to go over to printing. And if you have any questions, remember, just uh, post a uh, question mark and then your question. And we'll answer those questions just at, uh, at the end of the next session. Okay, this part I'm going to go over slightly quicker because it's also there's quite a lot of detail in here and I'm not going to cover it tonight. This is just an introduction. I just want to make you aware of some of the problems. And the other thing is that at this point, we really recommend that you use a professional printing service. We are very affiliated at the moment with Outdoor Photos um, Art of Print. They do such a good job. They've got great machines. Everything is calibrated. It is so much easier than trying to tackle this yourself. The, ca the trick is you have to arrive there with a correctly um, color managed picture so that when you, when you push it through the printer, it comes out as you expected. If your screen is warm or cool, then when you get there, the picture is not going to come out how you think it looks because it doesn't look like your screen. But yeah. Meet them halfway and have a good screen. So um, I'm going to just touch on some of these points so that you're aware of them, but um, I'm not going to go into too much of it. The main thing that you should understand is the difference between the, the, the actual way that the color works between these two methods. So we've got our camera, and I've shown you a couple of times those values, the RGB values. They are basically, it's an additive system. You've got green here. Uh, red and blue and they combine to make all the other colors and when they are combined with each other you get white and your screen is also working this way you've got little pixel cells inside your screen that let off light and there's a red one and a blue one and a green one and when they all work in full brightness together then it looks like a white part of your screen printing is basically the opposite it's a subtractive color system so it's made up of cyan magenta and yellow and the combination of these is what gives you your colors and when combined, they get darker and darker till you get a, a kind of black, but it's kind of a murky off black. So then you usually add this K value here is black, which you use in your printing. So it is exactly the opposite. So if you use your camera to capture a person, you've got these values here to make skin tone. And then in this one, you're using magenta and you're trying to mix it with these colors to try and get skin tone, for example. Green, our eyes are particularly sensitive to green. They're twice as sensitive to green as to anything else. And in this system, green is a primary color. In this system, you have to combine things together to get your green. So the chance of taking an RGB photo and printing it in a CMYK process and getting a good match is very low. The screen is backlit and the, this is relying on light falling on the picture and then bouncing back and giving the color. So just to give you an idea of how different they are, this is red, which is made up of 255 red, zero blue and zero green. That is its value in this system. But the CMYK, to get red, you're combining some red, some blue and some green of those pigments. And this is the shade you come up with. This is the brightest red a CMYK print can reproduce. So when you edit it on your screen, it looks like this. When you print it, it comes out like this. And there's quite a discrepancy, as you can see. And that's as good as it gets with that. Then with green, it's even worse. This is 255 green. So this is full green on your screen. When you print it out, this is what CMYK is able to reproduce. 
you've got to mix these values to get the greenest green that CMYK can reproduce is that value there. And then the same with blue again. So the question is, if you look at this color gamut here, you can see there's a transition from the black and it goes nicely over to the red and from the red down to the black and there's sort of this shade. If your screen is not well calibrated or it doesn't have a good gamut, then so these areas will just look the same. You can't differentiate between this part of the red and this part of the red. It all looks like one blob. Or well, in the black here, this black looks the same as this black looks the same as this black. This whole area here is just dark. These two shades that I showed you here, will the printer be able to reproduce it? Most printers probably not. So if you have an area in your picture you want to be dark, you've got your dark area and then a lighter shadow toned area with shadow detail, um, they're going to come out looking identical. So you might want to brighten your print up to try and get it to reproduce um, a tonal range. So don't start your picture from here, your pure black. Start your pure black maybe here and then work upwards so that when it prints, this comes out black, but you start seeing tones straight after that because the printer just doesn't isn't able to pr reproduce like the screen can it's just because it's a completely different process but apart from that is the printer reproducing colors accurately the way it puts it the ink down is it doing a good job and that can be dependent on a bunch of factors including the paper you used so once again it's a very similar process you create a profile to match with the paper and each paper you use should have its own profile now if you buy a professional paper like Hannah Mueller they make papers and on their website you can find your brand of printer find which printer you have and you can download the profile and this is again just like the camera hat and just like the screen head this is a file that is going to tell um, the printer and the computer to talk to each other to get the colors to reproduce well and with printing that can include things like the print head height the ink drying time and the tone of the paper because you can get white papers and off-white papers and warm papers and cotton white papers and natural white papers and bleached white papers and all of those things will affect the, the color of your image and the way this uh, the other problem is that this is Hannemuller. So they've got underneath here a click down menu of all the different brands of printer and they've made profiles for you. However, Canon makes paper, Hewlett Packard makes paper, Epson makes paper, but they also make printers. So you can go on their website and download the profile if you have that printer. But if you have a Canon printer and you want to buy the Epson paper, Epson haven't made a profile available because they don't care about you because you didn't buy their printer. So you might have to make your own profile. And it works again exactly the same way as we talked about in the other two processes. You print out all a color chart and it gives you all these different color values. And then you use this color spectrometer. You put it on top of a block and this is in a grid reference. So the printer knows what color is meant to be here. You take a reading and then it works out how much it should correct for. So have a look at this is the difference between the pictures. So here you've got a, what should be a gradient. So there's blues here. Here it looks like a slightly purple line. Here's some more blues and they, they're kind of jumping around a little bit. Once you've calibrated your printer, you should see it reproduce something like that. So now there's much less blues. You've got pinks in here, um, closer to purple colors, and there's not so many sticking out parts. It looks much more like a gradient in a transition. So that is um, once it's profiled, it's going to be able to reproduce the colors more accurately. So it goes from that and it reproduces it like that. Um, my printer was able to self calibrate and I found it best actually not to make a profile, but to leave it alone and then it handled the colors better. So I just let it do its own thing. If you take your uh, picture to a printing company, they will have a selection of papers for you. And for each of those papers, they will have set up a profile to make sure that the printer handles the paper and the colors very well. And then you can spit out your prints. Um, I think that's everything relating to that. 
uh, I haven't gone into too much detail with the printing. It's a bit of a process to set up a profile and to download them and to calibrate them, but it's only a problem if you're trying to print from home and you're doing uh, the process yourself. There's a few things to know about printers, like the number of cartridges and what difference that makes, uh, how to select papers and things like that, what the different, what your criteria should be for each paper and what archival means, but we cover them in the advanced course. For now, particularly if you're dealing with color management and you want to handle it, um, start by going to a professional company and work with them to sort of solve these problems. Are there any questions? Uh, Derek and Catherine are asking about the printer. In fact, uh, the printer is sitting behind Donny at the moment. If you want to see it, he can put it up on his screen now. It's a Canon IPF6300, and it's a A1 printer. It can print really large pictures, but it takes 12 ink cartridges, so it's incredibly expensive to run because each ink cartridge is about uh, it's over 800 rand ink cartridge. But there it sits. And that's because I, I, I started, I wanted an, an A3 printer and I ended up with that. But anyway, um, it, things got out of hand. Any other questions? Well, Art of Print advise you on which paper to use. Yes, so um, Art of Print have a selection of papers that they um, stock, that they have on, you know, that they use regularly and that they know and they like and they trust and they cover sort of a few different textures and the sort of things you should worry about. And they will show you, they will, you've, they've got samples there so you can have a look at them and decide, um, you know, which one you think you like. And then if, uh, if that you're very kind to them and they're feeling very generous, they will also obviously print test strips for you. So they take a slice of the picture and print just that part out. And then you can have a look at that picture and see how the, how it handles and how it looks on the paper. So it'll give you a preview. They won't do the entire picture like that because it costs a bunch of money, but you can do little strips to test it. I just want to ask, tongue in the cheek, how many of you guys are going to give up now? <laughs> I just I want an honest answer. How many of you feel this is overwhelming and, and you just, you know, you don't you no longer look forward to your photography? <laughs> so, so yeah. Donnie, if I can just, can I quickly say something here? Yes. I'm so glad that I'm only listening or watching this now because I just finished earlier today taking photos for a company that does blinds and curtains and I had to take material swabs, 150 of them. And it was very difficult because the colors and the textures are very similar to each other. And I did get nervous at a stage, but I pushed through. But if I had watched this before I started that, I would have said, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so I'm glad it's finished. I'm just hoping that it went okay. <laughs> Quite right. And that'll freak you out. Yes. Uh. As well. And you can do like 150 samples. You can fiddle with them in the editing and you can usually do the color quite well. The problem is when you leave the place and you don't have the thing with you, then it's very hard to edit it to make it look right because you have to do it out of memory and you have to do it out of right. memory of 150 samples. Right. So it becomes and it depends on, on the person. Where are they opening the image? You know, what does their computer look like? Um, because the whole idea is to... You can't control... Right. No. No. But all right, it's done. <laughs> now, it's worth mentioning because a lot of people ask that at this point. Um, you, you do all your pictures. You do all these processes. Then you email them off to someone and they look at it on the uncalibrated monitor. The right. one advantage is that when people look at it on their screen, they're very used to their screen. So they kind of compensate quite well for what they're looking at because they, if their screen is warm or cool or off in whichever way, then they're quite used to that and they kind of adjust for it automatically. And so they kind of get back to where you are, sort of. Right. Yeah, I, I just want to. I, I just want to add on to to all of this. Remember, if if you're going to do basic wildlife and landscape photography, that color accuracy is not going to be as important as, for example, for product photography and commercial work. And and there's also the personal 
your personal preference when it comes to, you know, whether you're going to pop the colors. With, with portraiture, most portrait photographers I know, their colors are very subjective based on what they like. Very, very often nowadays, we, we, we go for that old film analog looks. Um, you know, I've been very obsessive about the Kodachrome look now for some time. And, and you can basically download profiles and Lightroom presets for that particular color look that you're after, you know. And yeah, so, so guys, we hope it's not overwhelming, but it's just important that if ever you are going to do commercial work, food photography, product photography, that you, you, you know these processes. And depending on, as John said, on what you're going to need it for, we, we didn't want to blow you out of the water. We didn't want to scare you. The whole idea is just to give you a proper introduction. And, and also where John explained, I mean, right from the beginning, it was clear that our eyes and our brains are deceiving us. Um, even when it comes to white balance, we didn't speak much about white balance. We are covering white balance in the basic course, just the basic aspects. And in the advanced course, we go a bit deeper in, into color management.